Hello and welcome to Calvary Chapel Kamaki. This will be teaching for the 1st of May 2022 as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study in the book of Acts. Today we'll start chapter 21 and we'll look at the first 14 verses. And so let me read from Acts chapter 21 and uh, we'll get an overview and then we'll go back and look at it verse by verse. In Acts chapter 21 verse 1, now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Cos, and following the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. Verse 4, and finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home. Verse 7, and when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemy, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed Many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When, we had come, when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him, not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, The Lord's will be done, or the will of the Lord be done. Okay, so very interesting passage. There's some uh, spots in here that there's debates either side of uh, different views, and we'll talk about that. We'll look at it verse by verse, but I put a title on this, Traveling All Together Separate, and I took liberty. I used um, a name of a gospel group uh, from back in the uh, probably the late 90s, All Together Separate, uh, and then I put it in parentheses, a second uh, title, the Lord's will be done from the last verse we read in verse 14. So traveling all together separate. So, so in Acts, we've been focused now on the life of Paul. He used to be Saul. He had a radical experience on the road to Damascus on his way to kill Christians. He meets Jesus. Uh, he's radically changed. He becomes Paul. Um, and he's been traveling really uh, uh, the bigger part of his life at this point. So he was traveling to Damascus to kill Christians and meets Jesus and now he's traveling as an ambassador for Christ to bring people into the kingdom of heaven. So a radical change but still travel. Traveling altogether separate. We're going to find out what that means as we go through this. But um, the previous chapter, some really important uh, uh, passages that uh, Pastor Ryan went through so, uh, so clearly and beautifully last Sunday. Uh, and where there's this meeting of pastors on the beach uh, in Miletus. It's the Ephesian elders. And Paul, uh, you know, is, is just really uh, heartbroken to leave them, but he gives them warning about what's going to happen when he leaves. But so he's on his way. So, so we see that in Paul's life, especially following Christ, He's meeting people. There's churches being started all over complete regions. A lot of his writings, you know, like to uh, the Galatians and so on, are to churches uh, in areas uh, that weren't there until Paul comes through and, and the Lord does a work and gatherings start in the name of Jesus. Uh, but 
Uh, so that's a beautiful thing, but then there's always this departure where he's leaving people. It's this ongoing, almost like um, a broken heart, and yet Paul has a very clear, specific calling upon him. And so he's doing the Lord's work. And so I, I see um, a lesson in that. For everyone who follows Christ, it, it reminds me of when Peter was restored uh, in that conversation with Jesus, after Jesus had defeated death, was resurrected, and walking the earth for 40 days, he uh, has a chat with Peter on the beach, and he indicates how Peter's going to die, and then Peter points to John the apostle and says, well, what about him? And Jesus, very clearly, but paraphrasing, says, uh, you know, don't worry about anyone else. You follow me. And that's our life in the Lord. It's going to be very specific and unique and special. So altogether separate, uh, Paul's journey, he's got this calling. And so just like uh, we learn in the book of Ephesians, we're separate members in this bigger body called the Bride of Christ, the Body of Christ. So we're together in unity, but, but we have our own specific calling and gifting. And so uh, it's an interesting, I guess you would say, dichotomy uh, as we're walking with the Lord, we have this, this togetherness in the body of Christ, and yet we have an individual, specific, unique calling for us uh, to hear from the Lord, to obey the Lord, and, and to walk as we trust Him. So, so the whole way, we're taking steps of faith, and we're, we can say, Jesus, I trust you, and He will honor that and bless that as we do that. It, it's the same idea as, uh, if we draw near to the Lord, he will draw near to us. And so when we walk in obedience to the Lord and his calling upon us individually, then the Lord's hand will be upon that. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And we've seen that already in Paul's life. He's already been, uh, you know, part of uh, situations where he's stoned and left for dead. And uh, we're, it's, it's, that's just going to be his life now. And uh, through this study, we'll go back and we'll see the original when he's in Damascus and this uh, man named Ananias comes to him uh, and has a message from the Lord. And it's very clear that Paul's life is going to be very specific, uh, anointed, blessed calling, but it's going to be a difficult life. So we as Christians, as Christ followers, uh, we can rest assured that that doesn't mean it's going to be easy sailing the whole time. Now, it's a worthwhile a journey, but it's a journey that can sometimes be full of pain. And so if that's you right now, uh, you, can, you can just be uh, blessed and say, Lord, you know, I know that I can trust you. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that I understand everything, Lord, that you're doing, but I can trust you in that. So he hasn't called us to necessarily understand. He's called us to follow him. And so let's look at this verse by verse as we talk about traveling altogether separate in Paul's life. And so in verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, so after um, Paul had left uh, the elders from, from Ephesus there at Miletus, that we, when we, remember Paul, uh, Paul is, is the one focused here, but the we also indicates that Luke is part of this group because he's writing it. When we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to cause the following day to Rhodes and from there to Patara. So he's on this ship. And, and um, uh, in my life as a military kid and then the military myself and then my, my career, I traveled. And it was always exciting to me. So I can kind of relate to what Paul's doing. And then especially living in South Africa and having a kayak and being out in the ocean, I consider what it must have been like for Paul to get on a ship and to be out in the sea and how beautiful that was. But I wanted to point out a, a word here, the word departed in verse 1. It's only used four times in Scripture. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show us some of the, um, the times that it's used. In Luke chapter 22, uh, it's, it's the scene where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and uh, just before he's going to go to the cross. And it says that he withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. The word withdrawn is the word used in English in our passage, departed. Um, in Acts chapter 20, verse 30, the Bible says, Also of your own selves, 
shall men arise, this is where Paul's talking to the Ephesian elders, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. That phrase draw away is our word departed in our passage. Uh, and then uh, in Matthew 26, 51, it's in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is being arrested. And remember, Peter draws a sword. It says in Matthew 26, 51, and behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. I'm reading from the old King James because that's going to give me the definition of our word. So uh, in that passage in Matthew 26, 51, when Peter draws his sword from the sheath, that's our word depart. And so the Bible definition can also indicate or illustrate that there's a tearing away. So when, so when we see in verse 1, when Paul departed from the Ephesian elders, and it would probably be very similar every time he's leaving his loved ones, his friends, throughout now all of his travels, he's going to have this sense of a tearing away. And, and so when I was thinking about the Bible definition of taking a sword out of the sheath, I didn't really think much of that until I realized, well, wait a minute, uh, if I'm going to leave one of them, if I'm going to leave my sword and only take the sheath or vice versa, I'm only going to take, uh, you know, one or the other, then now, uh, let's say I have the sheath without the sword, and let's just say it's strapped on my belt. It's not really going to do me any good. It's going to be almost useless, and in the same idea, um, if I'm just carrying my sword and I don't have a sheath, then I have one hand tied up all the time holding that sword. And I'm probably eventually I'm going to find a place to put it down. And so it's not as convenient. So this idea of they departed. And uh, we see in Paul's life, and it can be in our life as well following the Lord, that as we're following the calling of the Lord, sometimes our loved ones, they don't even understand uh, that whole concept. Uh, of the Lord would call me into something that would take me away from my loved ones. And so Paul is going through that. And so it says he departed from them in verse 2, And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. So they're on their way to what we would call now uh, Lebanon, Phoenicia. And it says in verse 3, When we had sighted Cyprus, which is a large island in the Mediterranean, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria. Uh, that's also, uh, current day it would be called Lebanon. Lebanon's on the coast above Israel. And landed at Tyre, and there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples in verse 4, we stayed there seven days. Okay, let me, let me bring up another word. It says, the, and finding. And uh, that, that's a verb. Uh, but uh, it's deeper than what we see in English here as far as finding. It's actually a search. Paul was actively searching for these disciples. And so it really spoke to me as I, as I was studying this and being refreshed on what that word means. You know, we, in our life following the Lord, we can be active about things, including finding disciples. You know, uh, uh, people that I've met before. I need to reconnect. I need to stay uh, in this active um, search. Find out how they're doing, you know, so that we can be a blessing to each other. So that's what Paul was doing here. So, so what I'm seeing is uh, Paul being radically changed. He was on a journey to kill Christians, and now he's become a brother to Christians in his radical change. And then the last part of verse 4, this is where there's some debate. And it says that he stayed there with these disciples that he searched for for seven days. And they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. So here's the debate. Some would say that the Holy Spirit uh, was telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. That, that's one in just in general uh, stance. And the other view would be that the Holy Spirit revealed to these people where he stayed for seven days, he revealed to these disciples what was going to happen to Paul when, when he gets to Jerusalem. And I tend to lean that way. And it's because since we already have the whole Bible, we see really what, what happened in Paul's life. 
and we see that Paul was being obedient to his call, but we're going to see that clearly as we go on, as we, as we trek along. So let's, um, let's glance at some uh, references just quickly where it says, they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Let's, let's back up to chapter 19, verse 21. In Acts 19, 21, the Bible says, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So we see that Paul has this purpose in his heart, but it's by the Spirit. Okay, so, so that's specific. So, so if I glance back at um, our passage today in verse 4, it says, they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. It's not the Spirit telling Paul it's what the Spirit is revealing to these people. Let's glance over at chapter 23, verse 11. Acts 23, verse 11. In Acts 23, 11, the Bible says, But the following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem... So you must also bear witness at Rome. So back in chapter 19, we just read that he purposed his heart eventually to go to Rome. We see in, uh, by chapter 23, the Lord is confirming that. Okay, so the debate about uh, in our passage today, did Paul go against the Holy Spirit by going to Jerusalem? I don't think so. Uh, let's look at uh, chapter 20, verse 23. So just back up a little bit from our passage. In chapter 20, verse 23, the Bible says, well, I'll, I'll back up to, um, how about chapter 20, or verse 21 of chapter 20. Testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22, and see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. And here's the key verse of the whole thing right there, verse 24. But none of these things move me. So Paul's on the move. But when he says none of those things move me, none of the, none of the threats, none of the even... Uh, revelation from Holy Spirit as far as what's going to happen to me, that I'm going to be in chains. None of that stops me from following the Lord and being obedient to my calling. Uh, you know, this anointing that I have on me. He says, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race, how? With joy. And the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God, it's very clearly uh, portrayed in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Um, and so, so we see that not only uh, does Paul say that none of those threats, none of the scary things move me. Because see, I have this calling, but I want to, I want to finish my race with joy. See, that's a God thing. Uh, that's a Holy Spirit thing. We, we can't even walk this life uh, without the Spirit moving us and doing work in us and through us and from us. It's not going to be us in our flesh ever. And so uh, that's very clear. So, so that kind of helps me to see that verse 4, uh, the Holy Spirit revealed to these disciples what was ahead for Paul. Paul Paul wasn't surprised about that at all. He's already heard that. Verse 5, when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children. See, it's kind of a family thing, huh? Till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore, and we prayed. Um, you know, there's different kinds of prayer, and uh, when I looked this up and how it was used in context, I, I truly believe that this prayer from Paul was for these disciples who were concerned for, for Paul. I think it was a intercessory prayer uh, that the Lord would bless them and bring peace and settle their mind, you know, that we see in even Peter's writing. Uh, that type of prayer, uh, you would call it supplication. You know, a lot of people, they pray uh, ACTS as an acronym, 
that we're in the book of Acts, but A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. I believe that this prayer is probably in the realm of supplication where Paul is praying for those others. Yeah, he's not necessarily praying for himself. And so they prayed, and when we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. So here's another altogether separate. Here's once again Paul saying goodbye. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemy, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. So here, here is more brethren. And so Paul's always connected. He's connected with people, stays with them one day, verse 8. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea. This is what's known in, uh, uh, today as Caesarea on the sea. It's right on the coast. It's, it's a very beautiful place. Um, and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. And so, uh, meanwhile, just as a note, Paul is now about to complete his third missionary journey, and this journey has taken about four years. And then we come up on this evangelist by the name of Philip, and we're reminded Earlier in Acts, we, we found out that there were seven men selected to help the apostles, to help with things, practical things, as the apostles uh, were devoted to prayer and teaching the word. And so Philip was one of those seven. And we're going to glance at uh, some reference here in a minute. But it's probable that um, Philip actually saw back then 20 years earlier this man Saul as he's holding the garments the coats of the one stoning Stephen Stephen was also one of the seven uh, it's probable that Philip was nearby aware of it and then there was this huge scattering of the of the believers uh, to other parts of the world except for the apostles the, the Bible says the apostles stayed put but, but we, we're going to see in a minute that Philip hit the road. And as he's doing that, he is a bold witness to the grace of God and who Jesus is, the good news of what Jesus has done for us. So this Philip, it says here, the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. So let's go ahead and hold your place there. And let's just quickly glance back at chapter 6, right around verse 5, just to be reminded of this man, Philip. In chapter 6, verse 5, um, after the apostle said that we will continue to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word, in verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, there he is, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. So there's Philip. And then we can glance at chapter 8, verse 26. So in, in chapter 7, it's the stoning of Stephen after he gives this just beautiful um, uh, message of the gospel of Jesus. And then in chapter 8, verse 26, we'll glance at. Chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he rose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And the place in the scriptures which he read was this. And then he reads from Isaiah 53. And, and then uh, late, right after this, then he's snatched away and he ends up over in a, a different part near Gaza. Uh, and so that's Philip. We can also glance at chapter 8, verse 1. Um, in chapter 8, verse 1, Now Saul was consenting to his death, that's Stephen. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, was, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. 
Um, and so that group of people who are scattered probably is filth. We see that uh, literally. We just read that in chapter 8 where he's, uh, he's being a witness to uh, an Ethiopian, so a Gentile. And so here we are back in our passage in chapter 21, probably 20 years later after Stephen dies. And uh, so 20 years earlier, Philip was an evangelist going even to Gentiles as his, he's really escaping for his life as there's persecution. And then, uh, you know, in, in, in some ways running from the enemy of the church, which would have been Saul. And 20 years later, here's Paul, also uh, an apostle evangelist. Uh, uh, and uh, now they're staying together. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing what the Lord can do? So, so if you're in a situation with a relationship and it feels like there's no hope, just give it to the Lord. Keep it in prayer. Uh, and you follow Christ the way that you're called to specifically, and the Lord will work out everything else. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be friends of everyone, but we can, through the work of the Spirit, have a heart of forgiveness. So, so there's no root of bitterness taking root it's going to be this heart of forgiveness and the Lord's love just flowing through us regardless of the situation. But back in our passage, Acts 21, we'll pick it up again now in verse 9. Now this man, that's Philip, had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So they had the same gifting. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded, begged <laughs> with him, with Paul, Do not go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that amazing? See, he's got a clear calling upon him. So when we would not, when he would not be persuaded, we seized by saying, The will of the Lord be done. And you know, that's key. You know, Jesus himself even taught us to pray like that. Thy will be done, Lord on earth as it is in heaven. And, and so Paul knew that clearly, and that's how he walked, and that's how he lived. And so if you're like me, you know, I, I've, uh, I've traveled a lot of my life, but, but it wasn't until it was the Lord calling me to even move about that it really counted for much. And, and along with that, with this whole kind of a theme, uh, you know, departing from loved ones and, and people important, uh, uh, I can tell you from experience that uh, even uh, even some family members do not understand my calling, uh, that, that I answer to the Lord, that I am following the Lord as he's called me specifically, just like he told Peter, Kirk, you follow me. And so that's going to be true for every individual who have put their trust in Jesus. You know, you have this radical experience and you make that 180 called repentance. It's all the work of the Spirit. Now you're on a new path. And, and whether you, you just stay local where you were born or you travel worldwide, that's not the point. But we all have a specific calling. And so I would just encourage you to, to listen to that call and to be obedient to that. Um, just so you know, uh, our calling from the Lord will always match perfectly with Scripture. It's not, our calling will never go against the Word of God. Uh, and so, so we can be uh, assured of that, and we can be careful about that, and we need to be in the Word about that. We need to be in the Word. And so, so Paul knew his future. Uh, he knew he was going to be bound in chains, and, and so we know because of history that the, the next five years from this point, he's going to be in chains. He's going to be in chains for you know, a couple of years in uh, Jerusalem, in, in Israel. And he's going to be in chains still as he's traveling from there to Rome. And that's going to be a, at least a one-year trip. And then he's going to be in chains when he gets to Rome. But you know what? Uh, we're going to see as we progress in the book of Acts that um, that statement that he makes in chapter 20, that none of these things move me. He, move me. Uh, he wasn't afraid of that. 
Uh, he's even going to plead with uh, mobs of people. He's, gonna, he's going to be a witness to kings. He's going to be a witness to Gentiles. All these things are proof that, that it takes away this, this doubt of verse 4. That, well, maybe Paul shouldn't have went to Jerusalem. See, we, we have the full counsel of God and we know what happens. Uh, Paul will actually write a lot um, of New Testament scripture as he's in chains, you know, known as the prison letters. Very powerful, very important scripture used by the Holy Spirit. And so, so we now see that uh, Paul was on this journey that the Holy Spirit was guiding and blessing and protecting. And, and the purposes of Jesus was going to be fulfilled in Paul's life. And that can and should be us as well. And so uh, a journey, that's our life. And we're going to do that all together separate. Sometimes we're as a, a bigger crowd uh, uh, as Christians. And sometimes uh, we're on our own. We, we see in 2 Timothy Paul, right before he's beheaded, he says that everyone abandoned him when he, he first was going to um, plea his case. Uh, but he says something, in fact, let's, let's just turn that. I want, I want you to see this. In 2, Cor 2 Corinthians, at the end of the book, 2 Corinthians, um, in verse 16 uh, of chapter 4, so the last chapter of 2, uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, sorry, verse 16. Paul says this, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Okay, altogether separate. Wow. And then verse 17, very key. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. I, also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Powerful stuff. Well, I hope that's an encouragement to you, and I, I pray that you're blessed. Um, it's going to be great to see some of you at church tomorrow morning. So, Calvary Chapel Comic 10 a.m. I pray that uh, you're doing well and in the word and being obedient to your calling by the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Talk to you later. God bless.